Welcome, everyone. My name is Kathy McLaughlin. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Politics. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And I want to thank Bob White, who's one of our fellows this semester, for helping to put this together with the staff of the Institute of Politics. And Shira, who is going to be one our moderator tonight, Shira is also a fellow at the Institute of Politics. So this is a chance for you to get to meet them. And they both have study groups, which I'm sure they will both promote to you tonight, <laughs> exactly. because that's what they do. <clears throat> and uh, we want to thank our guests for coming up and, and sharing this film with us. It's a really interesting way to see a candidate in a different light than just what you see on presidential debates or in conversations. This is a chance to get a really different view of the candidate. So we're excited to have you all here. I'm going to turn it over to Shara, who will introduce our guests. They'll show some clips, have a conversation, and then we'll open it up for question and answer with everyone. So thank you for coming. Shara? Absolutely. Oh, great. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I think we're going to have a good time. You're going to see parts of the movie, if you haven't seen it already. Um, to my left is Greg Whiteley, our special guest this evening. He is the director and editor of MIT, in addition to other, two other acclaimed feature documentary films, New York Doll and Resolved. Stuart Stevens served as the chief strategist of Romney for president, has been one of the Republican Party's top political and media strategists for 25 years. And Bob White was the chairman of Romney's 2012 presidential committee. He's a longtime personal friend of the candidate and my personal favorite, a sh spring 2014 resident fellow at IOP. Um, like Kathy mentioned, I'm also a resident fellow at IOP this semester. I'm also the politics editor at Roll Call, which is a premier news source on Capitol Hill uh, for and about Congress. And now on to the making of Mitt. So Mitt, the film, as most of you know, follows Mitt Romney's presidential campaigns from his first run in 2008 through election night in 2012. Uh, Greg got unprecedented access for this much praised feature going behind closed doors to examine the candidate and his family's journey through two grueling campaigns. The filmmaker's own journey with Mitt started nearly a decade ago when he wrapped up his first documentary, a film about, and this is, these are his words, a cross-dressing proto-punk rocker. So very similar to Mitt Romney, very similar <laughs> subject matter. <laughs> After the film opened in 2005, Greg received an email from someone who spotted the governor of Massachusetts at a Boston showing. His film had caught the governor's interest, and soon after, Greg developed his own fascination with Romney's uh, fledgling presidential campaign. What started out as a two-year project about a Mormon running for president became a six-year-long adventure with Romney's family, friends, and strategists. Four hours of film were whittled down to just 90 minutes, some of which we'll see tonight. You can and should view the entire film on Netflix, shameless plug. Um, tonight we'll watch three to four clips of Mitt, and then we'll chat about them afterwards with these three gentlemen to my left. Afterwards, we'll open it up to questions from you guys. Uh, we'll start with the first clip at the end of the campaign, which is also the end of the film. So spoiler alert, everyone, uh, he does not win. Uh, this is an eight-minute clip, and uh, let's roll it. ABC News live coverage of election night 2012. No surprises yet in the presidential race. The big battleground states are still out. We're here with our entire team of experts and analysts. We have our reporters out in the battleground states. The two of you have been there at this very moment. And what's going on upstairs where the candidates are? What are they saying to each other at this moment? I feel like I just need to lay down on the ground and throw up. <laughs> How is everyone so calm? <laughs> Oh my I'm gosh, not, oh, I'm just I'm dying. Off it's finally hitting me. Oh. Get the panic out. Panics, Phil. Get the panic out. I really so want to go get slap me in the face right now. <laughs> slap it. As hard as you can. Go for it. <laughs> Think about it, Josh. Ready? Go for it. <laughs> I need one on the other side. Match it up. Match it up. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is good. Right, okay. good. Funny. right now, CNN has you. You're up by uh, 500 votes. <laughs> Where? That's not good. Florida. That's not good. The squeaker in Florida. Ohio. There's just no way. I know. Well, it was up for like six points. We were, and we were hoping yeah. for Pennsylvania or Michigan. I mean, you know, hoping. Yeah. We yeah. didn't think, you know, we thought Both it was called. a stretch. Both called. That was in Wisconsin. Oh, that's probably gone too. Did you know you lost Wisconsin? <laughs> but we're not coming in with that. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Okay. Mm. Did that just get recorded? Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can give us updates. I want to know the states that we win and lose. Right? 
So far, George Allen is up 2%. You're kidding. 26% in Virginia. Oh, that's good to hear. That's amazing is what that is. That's really amazing. You get them to sleep in their sleep. Wow. Good job. Wow. wow. Amazing. Wow. Wow, that's too bad. Boy, all those states, huh? Wisconsin, Michigan, Nevada. Well, so the, our, our only hope is Ohio, right? Yeah. We hang in our head in one state. All right, bye. Yeah, yeah. I just can't believe you're going to lose. I don't. Doesn't it make, it makes your life a lot better, doesn't it? Yeah, but still, I just don't believe it's possible that you can lose. Doesn't change your life, does it? That? Mm -hmm. no. The pathway still is, you know, Florida and uh, Virginia, which is really close, and uh, Ohio, which they're still feeling good about, because it's still just absentee balance right now. And then we got to pick off Colorado or uh, Iowa, or New, Iowa or New Hampshire or Nevada. It's down to Ohio, folks. It does. Mm. It does. Ohio. 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 You know, we talked to, to Senator Portman. He thinks that we're going to have a, a margin that we can't catch up to in Ohio. We might come up just short there. So, you know, the group just, we just don't want you to look like some, you know, John Kerry or... Hanging on, you mean? Hanging on. on yeah. You know, Newt Gingrich. Yeah. yeah. Just, we just want to do it right for you. And Ed talked to Carl. Carl was the last of the guys out there fighting. And, and Carl knows now that the numbers aren't there, and he's gonna he's gonna speak now. And he's gonna he's gonna make clear on Fox that the, the Ohio numbers we can't catch up with what's coming in. Okay, uh, let's do it. Yeah. So what do you say if we? What do you think you say in a concession speech? Let me reach what I have what I have here at Susan. Thank you. Uh, just call President Obama to congratulate him on his victory. His supporters and his campaign also deserve congratulations. I wish all of them well, particularly the President, the First Lady, and their daughters. This is a time of great challenges for America, and I pray that the President will be successful in guiding the nation. No one's listening. I'm not, <laughs> no, I, was I was following you. I was following you. Uh, shall, I send, shall I send it to you this? Do you want me to send it to you? Yeah. Yeah. Shall I do that? Yeah, can, that we can What's going on? We're writing a concession speech. It's finished. Yeah. Can you be gracious and still say what you think? I hope so. Because I don't, what's, I mean, I don't know, Spear. Obviously, you don't want him to look like a jerk. But he's in this race because he's passionate about what he believes in. Why not say, this is what I believe? Well, no one thinks you just spent two years and you don't believe it. Yeah. And, and there's tomorrow and there's the next day. And there's for what? Day. What? For what? Or to go out and make the change. I mean, he's not going to run for anything. He's going to run for anything, that's for sure. Make the case for it. How, how would I make a case? Where? Yeah. No, 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 uh, my time on the stage is over, guys. I mean, I'm happy for the time I had there, but my time is over. I think you're under. To oh, do, how, to do what? To do what? We're done. I think it's almost the pastoral role you're playing, not a political role. And the that is a part of what you're playing, I think, what you want, you want, is soothing people. I, yeah, okay. That, that's, I, I don't think this is a time for soothing and everything's fine. I think this is a time for, this is really serious, guys. This is really serious. The gap in soothe is not, is not my inclination. And that, I, and I, I, I cannot believe that he's an aberration of the country. I believe we're following the same path of every other great nation which is we're following greater government uh, money, uh, tax, tax, tax the rich people, promise more stuff to everybody, borrow until, borrow until you go over a cliff. And that's, and that's, and I, I mean, I think, I think we have a very high risk of reaching the tipping point sometime in the next five years. I just, I'm just 
Mm -hmm. and, and the idea is saying, hey, it's just fine, don't worry about that. Uh, no, it's really this not. Isn't. This election is over, but our principles endure. I believe the principles upon which this nation was founded are the only sure guide to a resurgent economy and to renewed greatness. Ann and I join with you to earnestly pray for him and for this great nation. Right. We're 593 words, so it's about six minutes. That'll be a lot of applause. That's fine. I think it's fine. That's, That's fine. Sure. Hey. Hey, Matt. Don't do it yet? Okay. <laughs> All right. How long do you think you'll still go? have? Okay. All right. We'll hold tight. Road right. says, Road says, don't do it yet. Don't call it. Don't do it, meaning don't call don't, Obama. Don't call the president yet. Why? They all just called and said, don't call the president yet. Why? So, I, I don't know. Oh, not over yet. So um, no. premature. Oh. <laughs> Why? If we lost Ohio. But he's saying we. I, there's a chance we'll still win Ohio, right? It doesn't sound like they're starting in Ohio. It doesn't sound like there's a very good chance in Colorado. But That's the issue for me. Cuyahoga County is. Tell them the way Carver is redoing the Ohio map. You're, uh, you're up in the popular vote, by the way. Mm. We haven't gotten California yet. <laughs> well, even uh, even reports with Ben Smith and people are saying it's crazy for Romney to uh, rush to concede. <sighs> Prolong the agony. Prolong the agony. Did you call her? No, no, no. It's 12.04. What about Colorado? We're down four points to Colorado. Four points? I think it's time. It's okay, honey. It's okay. Karen? Okay, stop. I'm just going to ask you. I'm just going to tell you. You know, my my own view of the Secret Service is. Courtney? I want to give you a ride home tomorrow because I don't have a car to get there. But then. Question for you. Pull up. The states, I have no interest in having them stay around for any more time. But Yeah. You know, I. I think you we're should go with what they suggest in terms. They'll pair it back. I mean, they. I, I don't, I, yeah, we're okay. The idea of them driving me yeah. what, one mile okay. once I'm home, like, it's like I will feel ridiculous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to hold for just. A okay. We'll hang on. We start. get a quick show of hands from the audience. Who's seen the whole film? Wow, that's great. Breath terrific. Um, so Greg, let's talk a little bit about what we um, just saw, a very perfect first scene. Um, what was going through your head as you filmed this scene when you were in the room? And while you were in the corner there with your camera, did you know that you had your material for the opening? Were you like, that's the, what I want to open my film with? No, um, but I had this, uh, boy, I was just discussing this last night with a friend who asked me the same thing, like, uh, um, this is going to be too long an answer, but I've made three films no now, and each time I've finished a film, um, the last day of filming, I uh, get this real <coughs> succinct sense of melancholy. It's poignant, it just, uh, and it's, it's really strange. The first time it ever happened to me, it really surprised me. I felt like I was just coming off this great high. I'd witnessed this amazing thing I'd felt, and I'd captured it on film. And there was just this kind of sadness. As I was filming uh, on election night, um, I, I, there was never a moment, I don't think, I was ever taking for granted how amazing it was that I was filming the things that I was allowed to film, um, uh, or even filming the things I was not allowed to film. I was, I, I was always... Um, I always felt it was uh, a remarkable, remarkable honor, and, and I was, and this was no exception. Uh, but I was thrilled. I was elated. Um, these are people that I'd grown to care a lot about, um, and I'm just somewhat embarrassed to say that I was absolutely thrilled to be there. I just thought, this is why I've been doing this for six years. It's to capture just this moment right here, where where it would sit in the film. I didn't know, but I was just. Um, I, I, uh, I, I remember very succinctly, uh, I've got to put the camera here. I'm just not going to stop rolling. And, oh, I've got to move right here right now. It's as though 
so much of a documentary film, you're making it up as you go along, and I felt very confident that night that I just knew where to sit, I knew where I wanted to go, I knew how I wanted to compose stuff. Um, and then uh, I was alone uh, later in the, in the hallway, in the elevator, packing up quickly my stuff, um, and he was, Mitt was about to go down and deliver his concession speech, and uh, I, uh, I just started to bawl like a baby. Wow. I just, it surprised me. Just even now, if I think about it, I'll start to get uh, choked up. But it, it, uh, I really, you know, I wasn't, um, I don't want this to go the wrong way, but I wasn't choked up that Mitt was losing. I wasn't sad. Uh, I, I felt, I, I, I was anticipated for months that Mitt was not going to win this election. I always had felt like I was filming someone that would not yeah. be successful. I don't know how to explain that or why. I mean, he had a, a real shot, don't get me wrong, but that's just, that's how I was wired. But I, the only way I can explain it is, I've I've <laughs> I've gotten emotional in that very same way in every film I've made, and and this one this was there was a special intensity to the making of this movie, and I, I just sat there in this hallway, just bawling, and uh, <laughs> and Paul Ryan and his wife <laughs> walked by me to get on the elevator, and the elevator button is right <laughs> next to me, and I, I just have my head down, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I can't remember Paul Ryan's wife's name, but she just gently. Mm -hmm. Leaned past me, stop. <laughs> just <laughs> <push> the, <button. laughs> the door opened and walked by me. Yeah, so that's. Wow. Yeah, that's um, what I was feeling. It was the both ends of the spectrum that night. Um, speaking of Paul Ryan and his wife, was there, um, did, uh, did you film any of them in the movie and did they know who you were at that moment? They, they only, um, <coughs> I was introduced to Paul Ryan when I filmed at the convention, mm -hmm. and probably the scene I'm most proud of was the sequence in which I cut together Mitt both uh, putting the final touches on the speech with Stuart, and then Mitt giving the speech. I was backstage with him, and I filmed him going on stage, and that combined with pool footage, I had the footage, and then him recounting to his family in the hotel suite after, this is... Uh, this is how this went, and I, when I got to this moment, the crowd laughed. I couldn't believe they laughed at this line, and then he regave the line, and I took all of that, and I edited it together, so that mm -hmm. it was both the pre-speech, the speech, and the speech after, and then during <coughs> that, Paul Ryan mm -hmm. came backstage and was sort of uh, meeting with Mitt, and Mitt was congratulating him on the speech he gave the night before, and that was the first time I'd met him. I'm sure he'd, he wouldn't remember me today, and I'm sure he didn't remember me on election night, but oddly, I saw him four times in all the time that I was filming Mitt, and I think something you don't realize, because you see them together on TV all the time, they, they really don't spend that much time together. Hmm. Uh, they're both, for strategic purposes, campaigning in different spots for most of the time. Interesting. Um, his presence perhaps was a little nerve-wracking for you, Stuart, at times, was it? And do you have oh, to be convinced, right. yeah, to let him inside the campaign trail? And if well, so, who convinced you? Th there was... Um, I think the way that the film ended up was focused on the family was, was really fantastic and really unique, and, and, and I, I love that. Um, you know, I've never been big uh, on uh, people who work in campaigns getting a lot of attention. I kind of am old school about that. Um, so the idea that um, we were going to make a war room type film where Bill Clinton never <coughs> appeals, you know, it's the sort of thing that had... No, no uh, appeal to, to myself and I think a lot of other people in the <coughs> campaign, but it really was not what brought Greg, and from what I understand, into the process was his, was Mitt and the family. And so to follow that thread through, I think, was really special. There's a lot of campaign films about people that work in campaigns, and I, I don't think it's nearly as interesting. Uh, the scene we just watched, you're kind of behind a water glass and one of them <coughs> on the right there uh, next to one of Romney's sons, and, you're and you mentioned something to Romney about the tone of his speech. I couldn't quite hear it. What, what were you advocating there? I um, think you said soothing. I, I think just, yeah, to, to just being just sort of aware that there were a lot of people that were really disappointed and um, wanted to hear. Being around uh, the governor you could see that he was going to be okay and that, you know, they just, they needed some help in anything they could to feel okay. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is something that we forget sometimes of how much people are invested in this process um, and what it means to them. And um, They're actually, you know, 
was a draft of a, of a concession speech. It was not one that he had written, but there was one the staff had prepared. So this idea that there wasn't a concession speech is both true and not true. It's, it's true that he had written it, but the staff had prepared one as you would sort of in a matter of course. So part of what he's doing is going through a draft there um, and editing it. And we're not starting from scratch. Of course. Um, of course. Yeah. And uh, Bob, you are notably not in that clip, maybe once very briefly. Uh, while that was going on, where were you? And what, what was your role at that point that night? Well, this was the end of um, a long journey, a long journey for a number of years, uh, both uh, a primary as well as this, uh, this five presidential. And that day was a long journey because Mitt got up and voted. And then we got on the plane with several members of the family. And we went to Pennsylvania and we went to Ohio and felt pretty good. I mean, the polls were really close um, within the margin of error in many states, and we had a feeling that we could win. So um, as the night progressed and you saw the numbers coming in, you know, there was a, a bit of a denial because we had held, uh, held out great hope. So in a room right beside where the family was, we had a lot, a lot of us on the phone with the various states. And you could see when Mitt first heard uh, how close Florida was in those early, he knew or we knew that we were going to be potentially in trouble and that it might come down, probably was coming down to Ohio. So we had uh, Rob Portman, who is a terrific senator and, and really dedicated himself to um, helping Mitt, was uh, the debate partner, uh, was on the phone with his people in Ohio and we were going um, district by district and holding out hope. But as the time went on, it was getting clearer and clearer that we couldn't um, overcome. Uh, so we were in the other room looking and hoping, and you saw some data that said we're going to lose, and then some data, wait a minute, and so there was, we were, you know, should you go down or should you not go down, and we were trying to get as much data as possible, and then it became pretty clear that we were not going to be able to overcome. There's always that moment when the candidate knows whether he or she has won or lost. Did you see that moment in that clip? Was that there when you knew he'd uh, lost? I, my personal feeling, and then we came in and out of that room a lot, but my personal feeling was when Mitt stopped and said, we're in trouble when the Florida numbers mm -hmm. were coming in because he knew if it was close in Florida that the other states, including you know, Ohio, would be, would be tough. I think that was a moment that, uh, that he recognized we were probably in trouble. Mm -hmm. Do you, you agree with that, Stuart, or was it earlier? I wasn't in the room then. Um, I, the numbers, uh, I mean, I didn't like the exit poll. Though the exit polls have been very bad in, in 04. We had gone through this before when I was working on the Bush campaign. Um, but in life, generally trying to convince yourself that exit polls are bad is not a great business to be in. Uh, I'd rather be in the business that convincing myself they look too good. Um, so uh, the exit polls were not super close. And you usually want a, a variable there that is going to play to your favor. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I always, after the hurricane, I, I really felt like we lost um, an ability to control the dialogue at the end of the campaign. And every time I've ever been involved in a race where we beat an incumbent, at the end we really had to prosecute an argument. And they're sort of like NBA games where you have to control there at the end. And I think with this <coughs> extraordinary tragedy that happened, um, it was just beyond anybody's ability to do that and, and really took it beyond politics, as it should have. But it, we lost that ability to go out and prosecute an argument against an incumbent president that you could then carry forth and try to build momentum. Um, there's a lot of data that could indicate that uh, the storm mattered or not mattered, but just the way it felt at that time. Um, we went from big sweeping rallies to sitting in hotel rooms watching right. you know, this tragedy unfold. You know. Right. Um, Greg, I'd like you to introduce the next clip that uh, we've affectionately called the Flippin' Mormon. Um, why don't you go ahead and tell us what we're about to watch. So this is back in 2008, and um, Mitt was in this, uh, for a while, very enviable position to do something that I think is unprecedented. And you could catch me, you would know this better than me, but I don't believe any non-sitting presidential candidate has ever won both the Iowa caucus and the New Hampshire primary. Mitt, for a while, was leading handily in both, and, and it looked like he was going to pull off something historic. Um, then uh, 
he sort of got outflanked by Mike Huckabee on one side, John McCain on the other, and ended up coming in second in both those primaries. And they're, the scene you're about to see, it's where do you go from here? Because he went from being a place that he was about to do something historically great to now being in a historic, historically uh, liable, libelous position in that, no, I don't think anybody had ever, I don't think anybody's ever won a modern presidential campaign without winning either Iowa or New Hampshire. And so he, now what do we do? And, and when we pick it up where it's a, it's a discussion with his campaign in his hotel room just after he's learned he's lost. Yep. New Hampshire. Can we roll the second clip, please? The flippin' Mormon. I can't fix the Mormon side, or I won't fix the Mormon side. The flippin' side. And that would hurt the flipping side. Yes, that would win it. <laughs> <laughs> the flipping side is a, continues to be a problem. And I think is the reason, but by the way, 27 papers here went along, went along with it. I can't do anything. They, I mean, it's like my, your speech has changed. See? You're flipping again. It's like, you can't change your stump speech? That's a flip-flop? If you change your speech? I mean, it's literally, there's nothing I can do, which is, you know, he was at Burger King last night, McDonald's and I before, I mean, it's really, is there, is there any way, I mean, do we put on my website what my positions are? Do we answer the flipping charges and say, here's what it, you know, you know this is what his position is in this, and, and it's like, there's where it is, and stop saying it? I think, I think, I mean, is there, I mean, I keep, your, I, you know, I keep hearing, no, but I keep hearing, for instance, you know, you change your position on gay marriage, you can, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I changed my position. No, I haven't, but they keep saying it. And it's like, is there some, is there not some way of saying, saying, stop buying the dog food that's been shipped to you from McCain? I did not change my position on gay marriage. This is about he did, this is about he did. Yeah. Stop, well, it's not, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. T time heals all wounds, I don't, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I really am not, it, by the time. Ten years from now, no one will even know. It's like, weren't you the guy that I can't marry? You know, it's, I'm not worried, it's, but it's, it's so damaging to me. That's it, how we all remember Kerry. <laughs> it's so damaging to me that, 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 um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that I don't know that it's going to be de devastating in a place like Michigan. Is there any way? And it's like trying to convince people that well, me, that that, uh, that Dan Quayle is smart. All right, you're not going to convince them that Dan Quayle is smart, or that that Jerry Ford isn't a stumble bum. And it may be a speed. Hey, I, I got to live with that. Oh, you flip and everything. In which case, I think I'm a flawed candidate. I love that clip for so many reasons. I love it because it's one of the few times I think he really shows a lot of emotion. Certainly, the angriest I've ever seen him. Is that the angriest you've ever seen him? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you see them angrier? <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, I didn't think he was very angry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've seen a little angry? Um, so Frustrated. Uh, Bob, at that point, um, did you think he would run again? Well, this was st we were still in a race then. Right. Right? We had just lost. This was after New Hampshire. Yeah, it was just after New Hampshire. Okay, so, so two. And, and a couple of things. Um, you know, we had done something very wrong in the 2008 by setting expectations really high. So our expectations, we had talked, we were going to win early and we were going to win often. And we raised a lot of money uh, uh, talking about winning both Iowa and New Hampshire. And as Greg said, that's really never been done. Um, so when we lost both, and we were in a place where when you lose, even by a small amount, you don't get any delegates. We were in, um, in potential trouble. So Mitt was concerned a lot about how we were going to move forward from there. So our big concern was Michigan mm -hmm. was coming up. And, uh, and we went on to win Michigan, and it became a, you know, a much bigger and better fight. But it was, uh, it was a tough moment because, again, we had set our own and outside expectations mm -hmm. and, uh, and had lost. Bob raises a good point. It's something, I, before I started making this film, I had, had no idea. Um, I just sort of assumed there was an established set of rules, and you go out and you get delegates, and you, the person that gets uh, uh, the most delegates becomes the nominee of the party and will then get to run in the general election. And uh, <laughs> as Mitt Romney explained to me, uh, what happens is it's really just a game of meeting expectations. Um, none of the delegates, most of the delegates that you win are not bound to you, so you're not even really winning them. Uh, you're really just going and going from one different beauty contest to the next. And uh, most people think Bill Clinton won New Hampshire, and that's what kind of brought him back to the map. He didn't. He took second, but he was the winner because he, he beat expectations so broadly. Mike Huckabee um, won Iowa, but it wasn't just winning the delegates that you win and winning the Iowa caucus. Mike Huckabee just beat expectations, and he beat this guy that looked unbeatable, and that's, 
from, from one moment to the next, you're, you're really trying to do this very delicate balance between keeping your hopes high, keeping your base excited and energized, and they're most excited when you're winning or when you're about to win, and also setting very low expectations <laughs> with the press. And it, it's bizarre. Were you a political person at all before you started filming this? Uh, no, not I, I thought I was, but I just because I read Time magazine a lot. Right. <laughs> after I after I met Stuart, I go, oh, that's what a political person. Is. <laughs> Fair. Fair enough. Um, the end of that scene, he admits he's a flawed candidate. Um, what were you thinking at that point? The film would be about. Well. Um, It'll be kind of the same answer. Whenever I'm filming, I, I'm always thrilled to be filming, and I, I'm not thinking too much about, oh, okay, this is a moment I know right where to put this. There's only been a couple moments in my life where that's mm -hmm. occurred. That's not one of them. I'm not sure I was even conscious of what he was saying. It was later when I looked at that, um, there was something about that quote that stood out at me. And, you know, anything in the film is because it stood out to me for some reason. I'm not sure I'm able to articulate why, uh, except that maybe. Um, there is this brand about Mitt Romney in which he appears to be not very self-aware. And I, I think that's an, a remarkably self-aware moment. So, yes. yeah. Great. Um, uh, Stuart, you worked uh, in a different role on the 2008 campaign as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of changes did you see firsthand the candidate from the Romney we saw there to the Romney we oh, worked with in 2012? You know, um, there's a couple of things that stand out. One is just, I remember vividly in 08, and, you know, we got kind of involved late, and, and we were getting off a plane somewhere, and Mitt said, you know, I've, he turned to me and said, look, you know, I've, I've done stuff in my life. I've run companies. I was, ran the Olympics. I was governor. But this is the hardest thing I've ever done by, mm. like, 100 times. And then he laughed. He said, like, well, why didn't somebody tell me? <laughs> and, and I think just the degree, oh, why didn't you tell him? <laughs> the degree to, of difficulty involved in running for president is so hard, uh, just the, the total combination of factors of difficulty. And if you look in the Republican primary this last time, the two people that probably knew the most about what it was like to run, other than, 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 than Mitt Romney, were Haley Barber and Mitch Daniels, and both of them decided not to run. Um, and I, so I think that he went into this with a, uh, in 2012, and, and I, I, I personally was surprised that he ran again. Um, I, I didn't think that he, he would, but with much more sense of um, sort of what this was like, and I think it, um, he has a great sense of humor and an ability to sort of capture the humor in these moments. You have to be able to be able to appreciate sort of the absurdity of um, this process we have of running for president, <coughs> like, like Greg was saying. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, We'll move on to the third clip. I think nearly all of you have seen it. If not on Netflix and probably in some of the previews, uh, let's watch the one uh, with the iron. What do you got on, Gary? You got it. You did. You were able to tie it. Yeah, sort of. Kind of. I was just about to come up here. It's frumpy, but I made it. Sorry to come up here. You look good. Yes, you look really good. I'm jealous. I, I, you looked at me and you said, you look good. You look at her, you said, you look really good. <laughs> look at this. She's gorgeous. It's, oh, it's I, I, pretty good, though. Yeah, it looks good. I wouldn't, I I wouldn't fool with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to iron something here, so. Look at the velvet. See, the, the, the cuff, this is a new shirt, so the cuff is all funny, so I'm. But well, it fits you great. So I'm trying to, and I should have done this before I put it on, of course. But Are you going to iron it on? Are you serious? Of course. Oh, on. oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this may not end well. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. It's working. Ouch. It's sort of working. Ouch. Ouch. All right, that's good enough, Nick. For goodness sakes. In black, you can't see wrinkles. You got the speech, Kelly? Look at the speech. Yes, sir. Um, okay. All right, I have to go down and make sure I've got my lipstick. It is my great honor to welcome Mrs. Ann Romney.
campaign can require a lot of wardrobe changes. Blue jeans in the morning, perhaps, uh, suit uh, for a lunch fundraiser, sport coat for dinner, but it's nice to finally relax and uh, to wear what Ann and I wear around the house. Uh, <laughs> so that was uh, just before and during the Al Smith dinner, which was fall of 2012. Um, and the irony of him being all dressed up in his tuxedo and then trying to apply an iron to his sleeve, I think is something that uh, we all enjoyed. But most of all, people have talked about it because of the humanizing effect it has on people who watch it, right? They see him in a different light after they see him trying to iron his clothes while he's wearing them. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, then there's also been a lot of debate of, about this as well, if there was a way to show the more human side of Mitt Romney, this guy you see ironing himself. Um, what do you think, Stuart? What would be the way as a strategist to show that well, side? I, I How would you do it? I think any time you're talking about humanizing somebody, you're probably in a bad place because um, it's an unusual phrasing. Um, it, 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 um, I think that um, it's very difficult to grasp a sense of who people really are, is running for president. And I'm sure that if you're uh, there were great frustrations inside the Obama campaign uh, at various moments, particularly in 08 when he was new, that you were not really seeing the same person. If you look at George Bush, uh, 41, war hero, youngest Navy pilot, decorated, Newsweek has him on the cover as a wimp. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, Jerry Ford, who's probably our most athletic president, was, was characterized as someone who, you know, he was an All-American at 19 um, and a great dancer. And was, you know. So um, I don't think it's anything new to the process. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, is a, it's a, it's a very complicated question of how we see these people and is it getting better or worse um, that has a lot to do with the interaction with the press. I tend to think it's getting worse rather than better. Um, that, that there used to be a, a more ability for candidates to spend downtime with reporters off the record. I mean, you, you could speak to this better than I. Um, and that was accepted as okay. Now, there's a whole question whether or not with reporters, is that understandable question, is that ethical or not? And so I just think it's more difficult and there's more barriers between candidates and the public, oddly enough, even though we have more coverage. Um, Bob. Uh, no one on this stage knows Mitt Romney better than you do. I think it's pretty safe to say. Uh, over the course of the campaign, did you push to try and show this, and did you advocate a way to do this, this human side of Mitt Romney? You know, um, having known him for so many years and gone through so many different experiences together, whether it be in business and personal and down at the Olympics, and watching him, you know, address many, many problems and, and turn things around and see him doing things like ironing uh, his shirt with it on uh, and lots of other things like that. You know, it was and is still frustrating and haunts me that after two presidential campaigns and a billion dollars of spending, it's hard for people to know the Mitt Romney that I know and the person who I think would have made a great president and would have brought a real humanistic side to all the other great things that he does and all the great skills that he has. So. Um, you know, we had lots of debates about how and what we should say. Um, Stuart and the whole team, we looked at opportunities to more humanize in the near term. And uh, I think, as Stuart said, it's a very tough thing to do. Um, but I'm frustrated, as many people are, that people watch this film and say, geez, you know, I, probably, I may not still have voted for him. You know, I probably disagree with a lot of things he says, but that's somebody, part of him I really never saw. So I think, you know, whether it's the campaign or campaigning in general, um, it's it's frustrating. And I have a study group that I'm a little shameless to plug say, right now. Alexa that is, my, to is my producer <laughs> here for the study group, but we're going to explore some of those some of those things because we have a study group that meets weekly and is going to talk about presidential politics and campaigns. And she's laughing because she has one also. So this is a plug. But I think these are questions we're trying to try to explore. Um, so I'll also take a quick turn to plug. Mine is tomorrow at 4 o'clock. It's about the midterm elections, gender, media, and the permanent campaign. It meets right over there. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, we should move to questions soon, but we have prepared one more clip. Do you guys mind if we watch just one, one more clip? Is that okay before we go to questions? 
Okay, great. And then I have more for you. So let's roll the fourth clip about, and this is uh, the afternoon and evening before the first presidential debate. We are about to have our first presidential debate against Barack Obama, October 3rd, 2012. Everyone in the world is watching. <laughs> no pressure. Let's get a little something in your tummy so you're not... advice? Yes. <laughs> Conviction from your heart as to why you're running. Conviction that this country's on the wrong course and that you are able to put it on the right one. Conviction. Complete power from within your heart. That's all. We came into this really nervous. The polls have been you know, not great. They've come back a little bit in the last couple of days, but there's a lot of pressure uh, to do well at the debate tonight. And uh, we were really nervous. Um, just thinking about President Obama, he's a great speaker and uh, just has, you know, he has the mantle of the presidency. So do you think this debate's going to be different from the others in that you'll be intimidated by the fact that he's president? Or you know, sure. Are you kidding? We shouldn't be intimidated. <clears throat> you should not be intimidated by him. I'm not yeah. joking that. He's a very good debater. He's a lot better than the other guys. He's a yeah. much more effective debater than they are. Yeah. To watch his tapes, he does a very nice job. I feel like I would be a little intimidated, but I think I think Mom's right. I think yeah, I would, Absolutely I would try should to put that out of mind. At all. My inclination, I'm, see, I would be afraid to kind of stand up to him and, and afraid of how people would perceive you standing up to the president. But I think. Oh, I think they expect me to. I, I think so I'm too. Not, I, I'm not worried about that. I represent the party that represents half the people in this country. I got selected by that party. I'm their nominee. And they're furious. And I'm, and I'm going to stand up to, the, uh, to this guy because he's taking us in the wrong direction. I got no they, problem doing that. When I get intense, it looks like I'm angry and mad. And, you know, and my eyes are in caves anyway, so it looks it know. looks like I'm being angry. Those are some of your, uh, they, they showed some of your better moments in your debates. Those are some of your better moments. Hmm. You know, they showed you smacking down Newt Gingrich. That was one of your best moments. I'll tell you, I'm good at smack down if I have a piece of information yeah, that I, I can smack him down with. I know. If it's just who can out-verbalize someone else. Yeah. I'm, but the information, you know, you, you're prepared. This should be an email with those numbers. Yeah, that, you know, what's, what's a defense budget? What, you know, what's a Medicare budget? Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay, bye. The thing is, I don't get is how come they don't understand like how bad it is? Don't they get how bad it is for the small business? I mean, they I think they put these things in place thinking they're going to hurt the big guys and you know put it in place for the big banks and the big corporations. But don't they realize how much it hurts the 35 35 people people in you know employees? They don't, they don't know how hard it is. They don't know. They have not been in a setting where you're trying to make it, where you've got a little business and you're trying to make it. They don't know how hard that They're is. They're all lawyers, aren't they? They're lawyers. It's just they assume it's always there, and business is always there. They're yeah. always cut. they don't know that that businesses fail, that people go out of business, that they you know lose their life, they lose their life savings, they lose their job, and not, they start over again. But they don't know how hard it is for a business to succeed, and they keep piling on more and more, thinking, well, that's okay. These guys will all do fine. At some point, they don't do fine. And that's the. But they never having been there, they don't understand it. In those early days of Bain Capital. When we were investing in businesses like Sanborn, you remember Sanborn, the centrifuge company? I agonized over that. Every night I thought about that. How are we going to get that to succeed? It was just, you know, and it didn't make it. Finally went out of business. And it was like, oh, boy. I'm beginning to realize I have a debate tonight. It's tonight, isn't it, that we're doing? Mm -hmm. Mom, can you have some chapstick on? Look, Mom. This is, it's not opened yet. There, there's a bunch of donuts coming out. Look at that garbage. Thank 
I think I've watched that clip five times today, and every time he's carrying the tray out the door, I'm like, really? No one can do that for you? <laughs> you know, something. Um, let's talk about the process of getting into the seed, right? A very important night. How, what did it take to get you there, right? Did you communicate with the campaign, and they were like, this is now then? Were you already with them? Did you wake up in the hotel room and try to find them? What got you to the very beginning of that scene? Um, it was any time there was a big event that was coming up, if I wasn't traveling with Governor Romney, I would uh, email one of his sons hmm. and just say, hey, and they'd say, yeah, come on, I'll be there. I'd figure out which son was going to be there, and I would go bunk in their hotel room, and then Mitt always wanted to be around his family, and so I'd weasel my way in. If I, if, if, if I went through the campaign, uh, you know, they don't, there's no upside for the campaign to have me around, mm -hmm. so that would go nowhere, and, you know, I'd if I was a member of the campaign, I would react exactly the same way. But the family was different. The family, the, the sons in particular were, um, they liked New York Doll. <laughs> and so they were, they, they, they really wanted, they thought, yeah, this would be cool. Let's make it, let's, let's do a documentary about this. And so they were, they were very helpful and just, hey, if I'm in the room, you're in the room. Did anyone in the campaign of the family get veto power over any part of the film? No, no one did. The, the arrangement was, I wouldn't release any footage. Um, while he, while Mitt was running for president, I couldn't release anything until he was done being president or he was done running for president. And, and then once that occurred uh, in 2012, I was, I was free to make the film I wanted to make. And I think you told me earlier that was your favorite clip of the entire film, right? Was that the one? Yeah, of, of the stuff that ended up in the in movie, the that's my favorite Please. sequence. Why? Uh, I don't know. The, the whole sequence. It, it, we only played a part of it. If you, if you watch the rest of the movie, he goes and he, he just kills it in the debate. And, and that it, when, we were, when I was watching him eat prior to it, it felt like a last meal. He was just coming <laughs> off of 47%. Poll numbers were low. Obama's a very strong debater. Uh, I, I'd never quite seen Mitt like that. And, and the, the room felt like, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm filming the end right here. And so when he just sort of pulls it off, it's great. Uh, and then there's this scene afterwards in which there's two moments that I think sum up why I like Mitt Romney. Um, one is this moment in which everybody in the hotel room, is he, he gets this hero's welcome coming off the stage. And in his hotel suite afterwards, he's surrounded by family, including his brother. And they are euphoric. They cannot believe what has happened. They, and, and Mitt just reminds them all by saying, listen, this has happened before. Sitting presidents have a really tough time in these elections. And it just, I just thought that's, he's very even keeled. I, 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 I thought that was remarkable. The second thing I loved was he has this moment in which he talks about his dad. And for me, um, if I were running Mitt Romney's campaign, I would simply have him go around the country only speaking about his dad. Because mm -hmm. there is something about, uh, there's a twinkle in his eye, there's a love that he has for his dad that I find infectious. and. Uh, my favorite moment in the film is him describing why he writes dad at the top of his debate notes before he goes, or while he's at the podium. I, I, I just love it. Mm. Okay. Um, we'd like to open it for questions at this point uh, to any of our wonderful panelists. Uh, reminder, of questioners should identify themselves. One brief question per person, no speeches. And of course, questions end with a question mark. So um, let's get started. Why don't we, oh, the mics are at each right here. Um, why don't we start here? Hello. That was. Uh, my name's Nick, and I'm a freshman at Harvard College. Um, and my question is um, to whomever has the best answer, which is <laughs> at, w at what point um, between 2008 and 2012 do you think Mitt Romney thought that he was going to run again? Because there's a point of confusion for me in the film. Um, it was kind of a bit ambiguous about you, you kind of, there were some thoughts about, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite clear. When did he decide to run in 2012? I think that's a question for Bob, definitely. Okay, hi, Nick. Hello. Good question. <laughs> um, well, first, so where, where, are you, where are you from? What's that accent from? Uh, the countryside of England. That's amazing. That it just, I could hear that. You should, will you narrate my next <laughs> 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 I knew that. I knew Sorry. That. 
So um, when Mitt lost, he had no plans about another run. But uh, he spent a lot of time thinking about the issues of the country, and he wrote a book. And the book is called No Apology. And, and I highly recommend that book for anybody that wants to have a, a better understanding of how he thinks about the opportunities that this great nation faces, the great opportunities we have, and the challenges. And as he was writing that book, he was thinking an awful lot, again, about what had happened in the campaign and um, where the country was going and what he thought the prescriptions for that were and lays out a group of options on most of the, mo uh, the most important things that he saw as the, uh, as the opportunities and the challenges. Um, and then as the field was getting uh, more and more um, established toward the 2012, uh, he actually asked me to talk to several people that we had um, worked with in 2008 uh, to critique the campaign, to critique uh, him, and that was in 2010-ish, 2000, yeah, 2010-ish, and there was a meeting with the family uh, where we and he uh, went through the opportunity and the, the, the potential to run, and we talked about whether we thought that um, the people that had supported him before would be there, and whether he had a good rationale for candidacy, and, uh, and they went through a very soul-searching process, having known what it, uh, it had been. So it was well after he wrote the book, uh, and probably a year and a half. It was probably that meeting was like two years, I would say, 210. Well, and also, I think part of it was that um, there was an expectation, I think, after uh, the 08 election that things would get a lot better, faster than they did. Mm -hmm. And I think had the country been going in the right direction and had things been going That's well, right. that, that he wouldn't have... Um, you, you wouldn't have run for nothing else. You wouldn't have had a chance. But um, you, there wouldn't have been, a, I think, a, a call to public service that he really felt because I think he really felt the country, like a lot of people, was going in the, in the wrong direction. Thank you. Over there, please. Hi, uh, my name is Max. I'm also a freshman at the college. Uh, and I want to ask about the last <coughs> clip, which I was really hoping you would show. Um, one of the things that Governor Romney seems to imply is that Basically, the reason that he believes President Obama and his team are sort of misled is because they're lawyers, and that follows a lot of what he said throughout the campaign, which is that we needed somebody who's a leader in the business world. Uh, but I think there's definitely an argument that somebody in the business world has a very specific view of the economy from a very specific part of the economy. They might not take for, uh, account for a lot of external factors, externalities, things like that. So I guess my question, which is probably for the two of you, is what is the reasoning? What is the argument that a businessman like Governor Romney has a better view of the economy as president? Well, I think he actually described, I think he just actually described it in that clip, which is, first of all, you know, regulations that get passed have a dramatic effect on businesses. And, you know, we need to build the middle class with great jobs. We need to have a job-creating machine. And if you've not been in business and see the effect of regulations, if you've not had to fight through what sometimes multiple regulations can do, um, you don't have that perspective, is the first thing. The second is you know, we have to live within a budget. And in businesses, you, know, you the private sector, you can spend what you bring in or you're going to be in trouble. So having the discipline of living through and, and having to meet budgets. And the third is um, just the leadership that comes from um, leading organizations. So, so my feeling for Mitt was that he had a lot of great business experience, so he had those. But then he went on to run the Olympics. And the Olympics was a really tough situation that when he went into it was broken. So that experience, after he had done the business and had the experiences that I just described, and then came to the state of Massachusetts, which was in tough fiscal situation, was able to not only fix that, create a rainy day fund with a great team of people who many had private uh, sector experience, um, and get health care here for them were a set of experiences that I thought would have very well met the unique challenges that the country had faced. So it's that multiple set of challenges, multiple set of living with what regulation can do, and uh, I think that combination is really, really important. Excuse me? Um, Thank you. I'll use your question as a, a quick segue to ask Greg about the business of this film, right? You've spent six years of your life uh, on the campaign trail before you even could go to the you know, and start putting together the feature length film. How did the deal with Netflix come about um, and when? Boy, there's, uh, so when you, in, in the business, uh, Stuart knows this, when you create something like this, you're creating it on spec. 
which means you're speculating somebody will be interested in it when you're done, whether you're writing a screenplay or you're producing an independent documentary film like this. You, you're, you're almost making it first, and then <laughs> as, you're, as you're getting ready to finish and, and land the plane, you're thinking, oh, well, all right, who, who, who's going to buy this? The normal people uh, for a documentary like this have always been, at least in my career, have been uh, people like HBO. Um, Showtime has become a bigger player. The Sundance Channel, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Discovery has stepped up. AMC is, is, is in the past known to buy some. Um, but uh, there were two interesting players that stepped forward and were extremely interested. And they were non-traditional players in, in, uh, in documentary speculative work. Uh, the first one was CNN. Uh, who has just opened up a films division and has become super <coughs> aggressive. They had a huge presen at su presence at Sundance this year, and um, they, had just, they were just releasing a film called Blackfish, which was getting great success. Oh, yeah. um, and I think in a way of sort of reshaping the direction of CNN, they had hired away a guy that was saying, look, we're gonna, uh, we want your film to become a flagship of what we're going to do in the future, and so they made a very aggressive offer. And the second person that stepped forward was uh, Netflix, who came in and just uh, were not just aggressive in terms of uh, a financial offer for a film of this size, but they also offered this really unique way of rolling out the film. Um, typically, a film like ours, you go to Sundance and you have people writing about your film. If, if it, it goes really well, after your premiere, you'll get some attention by um, some cable news outlets. And so it's not very often that a documentary filmmaker gets to go on TV, but in this case, it, it happens uh, when, when your film will just reach a certain um, level of relevance. What then happens is you wait, after it gets bought at Sundance in your premiere, you wait seven or eight months as they build this machine that will roll your film out in theaters across the country. And what that means for a documentary film is you'll play about 15 cities. And, uh, but it takes that long to create the film prints, to <coughs> transfer whatever medium you have into film, to do the sound sweetening they want to do, and to plan the PR behind it. And you've wasted all this great momentum that you had coming out of your premiere. Um, this is not why you're here, so I'll just wrap it up by saying, Netflix came to us and said, we're going to offer you X, and in addition to that, you can premiere the film when you want. And we went to Sundance, and we knew we were getting into Sundance, and we said, uh, can we do something we don't think that's been done before? Can we premiere hmm. while the festival is going on? Because we just anticipated there would be a lot of people that would be, what they call in politics, earned media. We would be getting a lot of just free publicity coming out of Sundance, and we wanted to just augment that a little bit with the PR budget and then have the premiere right then, and I, I, it was just too good to pass up. I, I, I think the idea of streaming, that we won't be the last ones to do it, um, I think there'll be others like HBO that are going to jump on board, but we feel like Netflix is about 10 or 15 yards ahead of everybody else right now in that game. Before, I think the, it's, there's been discussion like sort of why the campaign didn't release the film. So what Greg just kind of, this was Greg's film, and it was very much independent mm -hmm. from the campaign. And I think that anything that the campaign had done would have been seen as a piece of campaign um, propaganda. That's what campaigns do. They produce asset props. Um, and it would have been seen as different than a film. And I think that the, the, the great thing about this is that it was Greg's work. And you know, Mitt never saw it until he came out to Sundance, which I find amazing. <laughs> I never would have done it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, just for sheer embarrassment. But um, anyway, I mean, and, and so it has an integrity to it. And it's seen that way. Yeah. And it's not like, OK, and this is now we're going to try to sell you this. It's like, here's a piece of art. And you can bring to it what you bring to it. You can come away with what you come away with. And maybe you come away liking the person more, liking them less, whatever, whatever experience you have. But that's how we react to art. And we react to politics very differently, where we're being, with the expectation we're being sold something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a key distinction that made the film, I think, um, in part so successful. Yeah, and, uh, and I hadn't filmed the ending yet. So I don't know how, you <laughs> how you'd release it. But while the staging those debates running. would have been difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and to go through that whole election night and film them both ways, him winning and him losing, <laughs> and then I, yeah, but I, I, I also <laughs> think we as a nation become semi-psychopathic during election season. And we, we reduce um, our op the opponent. We, it's like we start rooting, I'm a Seahawks fan. And, um, you know, 
Peyton Manning is a jerk for one week out of the year in my household, right? It was Super Bowl week. I mean, this guy, this guy is a Hall of Fame quarterback, but no, he's, he's the worst quarterback that ever lived. We've got to tear this guy apart. And it's only after we win uh, or after that game is over that I can reflect and go, ah, it's silly. Peyton Manning is probably a decent human being. Um, so this was your fault. <laughs> yes, yeah, this, this is my fault. But I, I think this film, if magically it could come out during the campaign, Stuart's absolutely right. I think we see it through a completely different mm -hmm. lens. And, um, and I also think we view people who lose presidential campaigns yeah. in a much different way. We, we let down our guard. We become more human. We have more empathy. And um, ex-presidents, yeah. too, I think. Ex-presidents, true, yeah. You see this with George Bush. I mean. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I, I, so I, yeah, I'm just agreeing. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I was aggressive and angling and doing every uh, everything I could to try and get this film out because I had it, fil I had it done, a version done in 2008. I thought we were, I thought, okay, I, my, I put my two years in. I got this great little film. We're gonna go ride the film festival circuit and hopefully get somebody to buy it. And uh, I was just devastated when I learned that he was running again and that he wasn't gonna let my film come out. <laughs> Uh, just because, ah, well, you know, I've just poured my heart and soul into it, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. So that was a separate negotiation then for the second run. Well, negotiation with who? With the campaign. Well, was uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that negotiation would have been really quick. Yeah. Um, I just called up the brothers again. Oh. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Ben, and I have a uh, question for uh, Greg. Um, it, it kind of a follow-up to the Netflix issue. Um, Netflix has been pretty innovative recently. Um, House of Cards, uh, season two just got re-released, re uh, released, and they released all the episode, at, all, all the episodes at once, which was fairly innovative. Um, and so they've been doing a lot of innovative things in terms of programming and content itself. Um, your documentary is relatively short compared to all the hours that you filmed. And I noticed that, for example, uh, the primaries during the 2012 season are kind of truncated just because you covered that in 2008 and it's slightly repetitive. But I can imagine there's very interesting content with Newt Gingrich and all the other folks that were yeah. encountered there. Would you ever contemplate releasing a director's cut where you might have uh, uh, more scenes? I mean, I, I, I understand the traditional movie theater, you know, there's, there's time caps, but in this new era of Netflix, mm -hmm. I could imagine being able to release much more content that would be interesting to mm -hmm. political people like myself. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on how Netflix could leverage uh, more content? Or, or, or do you think it should just be the 90 minutes and, and, and that's it? That's no, a great I, question. I, thanks for asking that. I, I, I spent probably eight of the most intense months of my life editing this movie. And I, I got this thing down to a really tight, really quick moving four hours. And I thought, how do I get this to 90 minutes? And it was like killing my children. This scene coming out, <laughs> and this scene, you know, just for those of you familiar, you'll, for me, I'll spend, you shoot, and sometimes that election night scene, you shoot for four hours, and I'll spend a month editing that wow. scene. And there are 30 other scenes just like it that just, <laughs> it's, it's better if you just take it out, and it kills you. And the only thing, the only solace is, uh, there's, a, there's a website, mitmovie.com, and uh, in about four months, we'll start uploading some deleted scenes. If you're interested, come, come follow it. Uh, we're allowed, Netflix very graciously allows us to sell, uh, to sell the movie through that website starting in about four months. And I think That'd to kind of kick that off, we'll have yeah. some deleted scenes. So please. It's a great question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, up in the balcony, please. Hi, my name is Jacob Morello, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, my question is primarily for Greg. So we've, you've talked a little bit about like how the negotiation happened, or but how do you, you know, if I decide I want to, you know, document a, a campaign, how do I start that? Where was kind of the first step? Did you call Mitt himself, or did you, uh, you know, call Stuart, um, or did you go to the Suns? Um, and then I guess you just mentioned that there was a point where you realized that you wanted to do it for the 2012 election as well. So. When was that point? How did you make that choice? And then finally, um, were there any scenes that you chose not to put in the movie because you thought they were sensitive or personal? Anything that you could have put in if you had wanted to but chose not to? No, I mean, to answer the last question first, um, the, the only thing that governed our editorial process was um, does this make the movie more entertaining or not? Uh, or is this true or not? I. I I didn't receive any instruction from the campaign on what went in or what didn't go into the movie. I mean, I, I, I made the movie 
I began editing in earnest uh, late November 2012, so there really was no campaign to, to answer to. And, and it's, uh, yeah, so th to answer the rest, I went and I just, when I heard that the governor of Massachusetts had seen my movie New York Doll, I, I thought, what you know, I, want, I started paying closer attention. There was a little paragraph, I want to say New York Times, in which it described the governor of Massachusetts would be gathering with his family in Park City, Utah, over the Christmas holidays to discuss whether or not he should run for president. And there was something that just grabbed me. I thought, that sounds like the beginning of a great movie. I, I, and I, I mentioned this to a producer who said, I, I know someone who knows Mitt Romney's son who works for the Dodgers. It was Tag Romney who was working for the Dodgers at the time. I took, he arranged a lunch, and I, I had this whole PowerPoint, this pitch that I was going to give on why, and, and I got like, I think, two minutes into it, and Mitt said, Tag said, I, I'm in, I'm in, let's do this. Mitt, he took it back to Mitt, and Mitt said, no, this is, you know, this is silly. Um, and so Tag called me back, and he said, yeah, I took it to my dad. He said, no, but, you know, my mom said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and honestly, Tag, Tag said, if you showed up to, uh, if you showed up to our place in Park City over Christmas, I'm not sure you'd get kicked out. And that was Did you just knock on the door? I literally, I I texted Tag and Root. I grabbed my family. I, had, I knew we had friends that lived in Park City. We spent Christmas with them. But on Christmas Eve, I just, Tag texted me the address, and I knocked on the door, and Mitt Romney, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding, Mitt Romney opened the door, looked at me, rolled his eyes, and <laughs> welcomed me in, and I, that was it. I just started filming, and I just kept filming for the next seven years. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. That's absolutely excellent. Um, I just want to make sure we get, okay, great. I just have one question for Stuart and for Bob, which is, and by the way, it's a great film. We watched it last night. It's really wonderful. But clearly recognizing how difficult it is to change a narrative about someone, whether it's Jerry Ford or, or someone else, one thing that it seems to me clearly would have dispelled the myth that Governor Romney was uncaring or unempathetic were the testimonials given at the National Convention and in the prior ad that Bob showed in his study group yesterday. I mean, those are heart-stopping. And I wonder why, was it just a matter of allocation of resources on your message, or why wasn't that front and center? Just very the curious. Showed, I'm, I'm sure it was the Bob Gay And if I can add, this will be the well, last question, but, but if you'd like to come up and ask we something did, afterwards. Um, maybe. Well, it's, it's a really... Uh, it's, 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 it's a very complicated question. Uh, and first, we did show this a, a fair amount, actually. Um, you know, one of the oddities of, the, of this past election, which we had the first time since uh, the 72 campaign where both candidates were not in the public financing system, 40% um, of the advertising that was shown for the Romney campaign was made by the Romney campaign. The rest was made by super PACs. Um, and um, contrary to some, I think, sort of uh, understandable perception that, you know, there's sort of a wink and a nod between, on both sides, Democrat super PACs and Democrat campaigns, I can think. There's actually not, in my experience, has been. And that people are terrified of there being one. So. Uh, you mean between the PAC and the campaign? Between the PAC yeah. and the campaign. You know, you, you, so I sort of, you know, if you say you're putting out a newspaper and um, you're trying to win a Pulitzer Prize, and 60% of your content you don't assign, edit, or place. It just comes in and it's boom, it's there. And you're left to work with the remaining 40%. Uh, whereas in the Obama campaign, because they had a great funding advantage, because they were incumbent president and they didn't have a primary, um, as the next incumbent president, be either Democrat or Republican, will have, 80% um, of their advertising was uh, created by the Obama campaign, and they produced uh, twice as much advertising as they aired, twice as much, a little over twice as much as we did. So we were always in this sort of Sophie's choice of what it is that we will do in advertising. Um, after we won the primary, uh, we had about $4.2 million in April to spend on television. The Obama campaign had $130 million. Um, so um, one of the things that we found when we uh, – we tested this a lot and talked to people a lot, was the sort of threshold question for 
voters was, what will Mitt Romney do as president? Which, when you think about it, is makes sense. And then you would say, yeah, but what about this? What about this quality? But what they came back to is, look, before I care about him, I, I, I want to know, what he, what's he going to do as president? And when you came out of the primary, there was a tremendous confusion uh, in voters as to these candidates. Because it went on for a long time, and we found that a certain percentage of people thought that he was a Catholic who was against contraception. And, you know, we, we are so into this, we think everyone's following it. But I always like, and if at a certain point, it sort of becomes like you're in a restaurant and you're trying to eat, and there's these other people arguing at a table, and you just kind of wish that they would be – he gets kind of catches of the – snatches of the conversation, you wish they would just go away. Um, and um, it, so that became something that was sort of a threshold goal that voters felt that they had to know. And there was an attempt to do that with an initial series of advertising. Then once they reached a, okay, I like, this, there's stuff here I like, and, and it's interested, and there's someone who could be president, then sort of naturally, well, tell me more about this person. And if you think about how you interview someone in a job situation, it's not, the first question you have is, can this person do the job? Or you don't want to interview them, you're just going to waste your time. And then you sort of say, well, okay, this person can do the job, but what kind of person is he? And that sort of process becomes, well, tell me more about your family, and tell me more about how you would make this decision, and how, but first you need to know that that person is up to that job. So, um, we were always in a situation that we needed to do a lot of things at once because we emerged from the primary behind with uh, a what we call negative fave unfave, where more people had a, a negative impression of him than a favorable impression. So we were sort of like one of these uh, teams that you get into a football game where you know you you need to establish your running game and you need to pass and you need to do this. Um, and there's a very interesting book that I, I really uh, would recommend to everyone called The Gamble, which is by two political scientists, John Sides and Lynn Varick. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find it, it's a data-driven analysis of the campaign. And I learned a lot reading it from them. And they really have attempted, I think, to do sort of the opposite of game-changing. It's not anecdote-driven, it's data-driven. Um, and it's, it's really um, quite informative of the um, larger forces of the campaign. So um, what we were always in the situation of asking ourselves is, what do we have to do now to stay alive? And, and to what is it not that we'd like to do, but what is it that we feel that if we don't do this, we will be disqualified? And that's a tough situation to be in. Um, and it's sort of akin to scheduling a presidential campaign. When people say you should campaign in Richmond, you should campaign in... In, in Sioux City, you should campaign in Orlando. They're all right. You should. <laughs> but you can only do one. <laughs> and it's, it's sort of the, um, thing. the, the, the uh, great advantage that the Obama campaign had, besides having the, the, the uh, Oval Office mechanism, and I worked for the Bush re-election in 2004, and it's a tremendous, it's more fun um, <laughs> to have that apparatus. Um, but um, is they had four years to plan this. And uh, a lot of their um, efforts could build to a crescendo, whereas, you know, when we were out there trying to survive in Iowa, they're out trying to win Ohio. And when we're trying to, you know, win uh, Florida or win uh, Illinois or win these primaries, um, they were able to prepare for a general election campaign. And we've had, you know, we've now have sort of institutionalized in these campaigns these series of post-mortems, which having done it for Bush and having done it now for Romney, it's a lot more fun when you win. Um, but when you talk to them, they, they will talk about sort of how they could begin to plan four years out and have the resources to do this. Um, it's a huge advantage for incumbent presidents, and it's why, particularly when they're not in the federal funding system, which uh, has made a big difference. Um, but um, anyway, that's a long-winded way to answer the question. Um, can we please thank our panelists today? Greg, Stewart, and Bob, thank you very much. And thanks to you all for coming this evening. You can watch the film again on Netflix. Thanks for coming.